Hello and I welcome you all for this second and concluding lecture on um, Arvindo Ghosh. And in this lecture, we are going to discuss his thought on community and religion. So, today we are going to discuss his thought on community and religion. We already had a lecture um, on Arvindo and we have discussed his thought on self and notion of the self and we see how it is uh, related and connected to the other thinkers certainly like uh, Rabindranath Tagore and his views on self. So, uh, we have discussed that in uh, our previous lecture, today we will uh, focus more on Arvindu's uh, views on community and religion and I will begin with his views on community and then we will also discuss his views on nationalism and how that is connected with religion and his views on Gita. And finally, we will conclude this lecture by uh, critically assessing some of the uh, key ideas in Arvindu Ghosh and what are the scholarly uh, um, uh, criticism uh, to Arvindu Ghosh and his thought. So, on Arvindu Ghosh, uh, this rhetoric of religion and here the religion is not something which is kind of organized form of worship. For Arvindu Ghosh, religion is something which is broader which is something that enables the man to realize the existence of something which is supreme, which is something universal. And therefore, in all his political and spiritual articulation and thought, uh, the rhetoric of religion is very much, um, uh, very much uh, central. So, um, Arvindu used this rhetoric of religion in his political writings as a means of communication to those who were otherwise non-participative in the political domain. It was a distinct way of engaging people in a non-violent struggle against the colonialism or colonial rule. So, uh, besides that um, um, uh, speculative or intellectual uh, urge to understand the significance of religion for realizing of self and relationship of self with the others, uh, Arvindu also has the practical uh, uh, use of this rhetoric of religion to mobilize those who were, those here means the, his native, uh, native um, uh, countrymen in Bengal or in the rest of India and they use the rhetoric of religion, uh, uh, the vocabulary of religion to mobilize them, to enable them to participate in the political arena and to fight against the British rule. Now, um, uh, this we can understand in the historical context in which Arvindu Ghosh and many others were, uh, were uh, writing or articulating uh, their ideas. So, starting from Bankim Chan Chatterjee, um, Anand Mutt and the uh, invocation of uh, symbols and uh, vocabulary which is deeply embedded in one, uh, one particular uh, form of religious uh, tradition. Uh, this remains um, uh, there in many other thinkers including Rabindranath Tagore and Arbindu Ghosh as well. And this we also have to understand in a um, theoretical, uh, theoretical sense when they were, uh, uh, they were confronting an overpowering or over dominating foreign rule or British uh, dominance, uh, the resource on which they can rely and then confront this over dominating power was more in the domain of religion, more in the domain of uh, spirituality and therefore, they invoke these terms because through them, they can connect with the masses and mobilize them, enable them to participate participate in the political struggle against the British rule. So, uh, this theory is there in Partha Chatterjee uh, 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 distinction between inner and outer domain. If some of you are uh, interested, you can look at some of his writings where he discussed this um, inner and outer domain, certainly nation and its fragments and also some other articles. Now, what uh, Part, uh, Partha Chatterjee decides between this inner and outer domain is that in inner domain that is the domain of religion and spirituality, Indians are far superior than the British and uh, that becomes their source of confidence, source of um, strength to confront this uh, foreign rule. But in the outer domain that is the do domain of material, political, economy, 
uh, they may learn from the British and then uh, they can um, uh, um, they can beat them, they can learn uh, learn from them and gradually they can surpass them also. So, this uh, uh, vocabulary or invocation of religious term and terminology in Arbindo's thought also has a practical necessity to mobilize the natives for uh, political struggle. Now, one of the scholar Andrew Sartori regards his appeal to religious discourse not as a direct traditional attachment to Hinduism, but an act of traditionalism seeking to use it as a means of appealing to the national popular who were subject to the appeal and authority of religion. So, the religiosity of Indians requires him or many uh, other thinkers like him who wanted to uh, mobilize their support for uh, anti-colonial struggle, they had to resort to this voc vocabulary because the masses, the most of Indians were um, uh, more familiar with these terms and uh, it was easier for them to mobilize them using or invo uh, invoking these terms. So, the authority of religion and appeal of religion was so intense among the citizens or Indians or uh, the fellow countrymen that, uh, um, that uh, Arvindu Ghosh and many other uh, modern Indian thinkers at least in the first phase of anti-colonial struggle thought of using these uh, rhetorics, these tool to mobilize public opinion and this is not to do with a kind of religious attachment to one particular religion, but to use it politically to mobilize the masses for anti-colonial struggle. In this context, he can be regarded as a historical figure responding to the immediate context. So, the partition and other oppressive policies of the government uh, force him to use uh, these rhetorics, these uh, vocabulary and respond to the immediate uh, immediate context using such vocabulary and that makes him a kind of historical figure and his engagement with the religious discourse can be treated as a ramification of the failure of the Swadeshi movement. Now, many scholars have argued that the Swadeshi movement failed and it lead to some kind of acrimonious relationship between two larger communities, Hindu and Muslims and that lead to its uh, failure. And there is the validity in such criticism also like Sumit Sarkar have argued and many others like him, but real strength of such, uh, such a discourse was it was easily accessible and comprehensible for the masses. And Gandhi certainly when there was a uh, mass character of Indian national movement used and continued to use uh, such rhetorics of religion to mobilize the masses. So, the uh, strength of this vocabulary or rhetorics of religion remains very significant during the anti-colonial struggle and Arvindu was a um, very um, uh, significant historical figure in terms of using such vocabulary or defining the nation as motherhood or as a uh, nationalism as a religion or having organic uh, existence like an individual. So, um, uh, so uh, Arvindu goes in that sense was uh, um, uh, responding to the immediate context while using this vocabulary. Now, uh, this um, um, uh, use of uh, uh, religious rhetorics can also be understood in the light of his conception of an ideal state. Now, Arvindu was not just a political radical activist, but also a visionary and in his vision the conception of nation or a state was very different from the many other pragmatic political. Uh, thinkers of uh, his time and in his conception of ideal state uh, which is more ethical and not a kind of mechanical system which fulfills the material or physical needs of the individual. He was conceptualizing a state or ideal state which will make individual ethical or moral and uh, uh, that ethical and moral is to enable the individual to connect with the larger uh, larger self or the supreme self, uh, which we have discussed in the previous lecture. So, this invocation, invocation of uh, religious uh, doctrine or religious terminology to uh, can be also understood uh, when we understand his ethical, um, ethical view of life and also the notion of ideal state in his thought. Now, uh, 
as I was saying, there is ample use of religion for practical reason. It is spirituality and not religion as his central focus of thought. So, uh, here the religion is not a kind of organized uh, uh, system of worship for him. Religion and religious vocabulary is something which enables the individual to realize himself, connect with the others and connect with the larger humanity. So, this three layer movement of um, individual self from uh, uh, the physical biological being to the community, his or her community and then the community to the larger humanity. That can be connected and uh, that is the uh, spiritual evolution in his thought and therefore, um, uh, this um, um, uh, uh, religious vocabulary in his thought also has some practical, uh, practical reasons besides his vision on ideal state. Now, what is this a spiritual region of humanity? That is, this a spiritual religion for Aurobindo is something very different from any one uh, creed or any one organized form of religion, be it Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or any other uh, ism. So, uh, for him, the uh, source of uh, uh, humanity or unity uh, in human uh, unity uh, or human unity is possible through this spiritual religion and this spiritual religion is very uniquely interpreted in his um, in his works so this spiritual religion is the means for universal human unity arbindo talks of a spiritual religion of humanity for him a spiritual foundation can lead to the psychological unification of people which will equally respect the socio cultural diversity among them now this spiritual religion is um, very specific which can also be connected to integral pluralism uh, as beer mehta puts it now what is this integral uh, pluralism that means the all self is connected with one or same form of energy or same form of supreme being and yet it can be manifested in different ways in different uh, um, uh, culture in different ethos and yet they can all uh, fulfill or connect with each other through mutual love or empathy or um, solidarity so, th that form of empathy, solidarity, mutual love can lead to the psychological unification and not the organized form of um, uh, re uh, religion or community or nation state or this atomistic or rational conception of individual. So, for him the spiritual religion will come to discuss uh, what this uh, spiritual religion is, but here it is uh, significant to note that for him this uh, spiritual religion is the basis for psychological unity among the different socio-cultural groups and community and it can form a kind of integral humanity, unity among different socio-cultural groups. Here to be more uh, specific about what this uh, spiritual religion is, for Arbindo a uh, spiritual religion of humanity does not imply a universal religion that is to say one form of religion followed by everyone in the world. So, uh, for him the spiritual religion do not mean does not equal to universal religion and he writes mankind has tried such unity by that means, that means here the universal religion. So, there should be one religion, one world and that one religion in one world will create true unity among the people. For Arvindu goes that cannot be possible, that cannot uh, lead to desired uh, desired uh, ends or desired objective. So, he writes that mankind has tried unity by that means, that means universal religion, it has failed and deserved to fail, because there can be no universal religious system, one in mental creed and vital form. So, why it has failed and deserved to fail? because for Aurobindo there cannot be universal religious system which is one in mental creed or vital form or then constitute a spiritual religion. For Aurobindo goes the inner spirit in all of us which is indeed one, but more than any other 
the spiritual life insists on the freedom and variation in self expression and means of development. Now, this realization of inner spirit which is one and same in all, but it can manifest itself in various ways or it can develop itself in so many ways, yet it can attain the same result of universal solidarity or unity uh, uh, which uh, is impossible to uh, achieve or attain through a organized form of universal religious system. So, the spiritual religion is a kind of realization of your inner self which manifests the one and same spirit, but it can express itself in so many social cultural uh, ways and attain such realization in different ways. So, there is a plurality in such realization or self expression and yet there is a kind of integralism where you realize the inner self in one or inner spirit in one and all is uh, uh, all, all is same. And he uh, further writes that a religion of humanity means the growing realization that there is a secret spirit, a divine reality in which we are all one, that humanity is the highest present vehicle on earth and that the human race and human being are the means by which it will progressively reveal itself. Now, he further explain this spiritual religion which enables that realization that there is a secret spirit or divine reality and this divine reality enables us to recognize, to acknowledge that we are all one and this humanity is something which is highest on earth and this humanity is manifested or expressed through the human being, um, uh, individual or collective on, uh, on this earth. So, the higher spiritual divine self on earth which is the ultimate or the um, um, supreme being for Arvindu Ghosh manifests itself through the individual and therefore, that individual becomes the vehicle of universal uh, uh, universal spirit or the higher spirit to manifest itself in the physical world. So, um, there is a kind of continuous movement or evolution uh, in Arvindo's thought about um, religion or certainly a spiritual religion which is growing realization about the existence of this supreme being and also then the uh, process or the practices of uh, manifesting or um, uh, developing solidarity or interconnection between individual and the community on the one hand and different communities uh, and humanity uh, at large uh, which is the um, highest uh, uh, manifestation or ultimate manifestation of universal spirit on the other. So, there is a kind of integral interconnections between between these three which is very different from uh, uh, from the universal religion. Now, what is a spiritual society and a state? For um, Arvindo Ghosh, he envisioned a spiritual society in contrast to a bourgeoisie or a socialist society. So, in a bourgeois society, the emphasis is more on individual as a self-defining rational agent and this self-defining rational agent is atomistic self and given the condition of freedom, uh, this self can attain or realize itself. On the other hand, the socialist society emphasis is more on equality. Now, Arvindu Ghosh and his vision of society is very different from these two conceptualization of society or state, which is more a kind of a mechanical, instrumental vis and also look at individual in a very uh, uh, narrow or limited sense of uh, his uh, or her being. For Arvindu, the society and the role of society is to enable the individual to realize his uh, uh, superior self or uh, manifestation of supreme self in his life and then accordingly pursue his or her on, um, on goals uh, in the life. So, for Arvindo then the concern of the uh, spiritual society is not to solve the material problems, whether it is the question of freedom or the question of material redistribution or attaining 
economic equality, but its emphasis lies on creating a new basis of our being, life and knowledge. So, what is knowledge, what is life, what is the basis of our own being, that is radically articulated by Aurobindo and for him the role of a state and society is to create the condition or enable the individual to think about his uh, life, not in isolation, uh, a kind of autonomous atomistic self as in bourgeoisie society or state or in a socialist society which is the collective is over dominating on the individual. So, individual submerged in a kind of collective uh, self of society or community and its focus on equality. For him, the uh, ideal society or spiritual society will enable the individual to understand the basis, true basis of his life and also what is the meaning of life. It is not the uh, material, physical, uh, um, physical problem and challenges which needs to be solved, but also the uh, spiritual uh, attainment, the uh, spiritual side of human uh, human life and uh, what constitute then the knowledge. Knowledge is not then just to maximize one's interest, but also to understand the larger objective of uh, life and then following the practices which help in attaining such, uh, uh, such objectives. So, he talks about economics of a spiritualized society. Here it is necessary to point out as Aurobindo is a syncretic thinker who was synthesizing different strands of thought, different cultural traditions and did recognize the role of science and technology and material side of existence. But he did not limit the individual or his conception of individual or a spiritual life to merely a material economic uh, economic side of life only as you find in some of the um, socialist uh, socialist society. So, for him uh, it, this uh, economics of a spiritualized society is to provide all men the joy of work in accordance to their nature and leisure to their inner development. Its aim is not to create a machinery of production, but to offer all a prosperous and beautiful life. So, for him the economics of a spiritualized life is not to solve the material problem of men, but to um, give them all the joy of work. So, work is uh, uh, necessary, works I work is essential, but work is not an end in itself. So, for him the work should be provided, so that everybody everyone can realize the joy of work according to their nature and leisure to their inner development. So, as uh, significant is job, similarly the leisure to develop one's inner self or inner search or inner urge in the self is equally uh, significant. So, he was conceptualizing a society which will enable the individual uh, to enjoy his work according to his or her nature, but also a leisure to develop himself or herself according to the inner urge or inner development of his or her uh, character. So, therefore, the aim of this kind of society is not to create a machinery of production. So, what we find in the free capitalist society or liberal bourgeois society. So, the profit maximization of profit, uh, um, new or more technical or advanced technical mode of production and the focus on more and more production and giving more and more employment. So, uh, uh, so uh, Arvindo in a sense synthesize all these things where the significance of work is there, but equally important is the leisure to develop one's inner self or the inner development. So, its aim is therefore, is not to create a machinery of production. Uh, but to offer all a prosperous and beautiful life. So, the meaning of life is not just to do the work, but also to realize the inner self, the life which is more meaningful or prosperous when it gets the leisure to, uh, to uh, lead one's life according to one's own inner nature or inner self. So, in a spiritual state, people would be regarded as a group souls endowed with divinity. So, again the question of religion, religious vocabulary is so central in his thought. It would allow them to develop collectively 
for the common purpose of humanity. So, this understanding of we are all part of same family or same community will develop gradually once individual get the condition or uh, chance to work and also leisure to introspect to to examine many inner uh, inner um, uh, uh, inner urge within his or her personality and then on the basis of such understanding or realization he or she can better connect with the other um, other self or uh, communities and that ultimately lead to a kind of psychological emotional uh, unity among the people and that is the common purpose of humanity and his ashram in Oroville is uh, based on such principle of universal humanity and not divided on either caste, uh, religion, creed or nation. So, uh, in his thought then what we find about science, religion and society, for him both science and religion hold equal importance as both are necessary for human development. So, for the progress of humanity or human development, the role of science, technology along with religion is equally important. And he tried to accommodate both science and religion in his thinking to get a kind of synthesizing knowledge about the role of technology or science in human progress and how it can enable the realization of self or realization of true self. But dominance of science and technology can result in isolating the individual which create a sense of insignificance and powerlessness in him. So, many bourgeois society, liberal bourgeois society what you also have, despite of all kind of progress in material economic life, uh, the uh, gradual or more and more realization of um, helplessness or uh, aloofness or isolation, uh, which uh, becomes a kind of uh, challenge. In many contemporary society, you will find uh, individual uh, despite of uh, material economic prosperity, gradual realization or increasing realization of their isolation, their, uh, uh, their um, uh, uh, helplessness to uh, challenge many uh, social political, uh, political issues of the time. So, um, uh, Arvindu Ghosh while acknowledging the role of science and technology also understood the limit of the domination of the or increasing reliance on science and technology at it may lead to a situation where individual may feel more and more isolated or um, or power uh, power powerless so the goal of society then is to help in achieving the ideal of life which is basically understanding the reality of human existence so what is the reality of ex uh, uh, reality of existence and individuals should realize that their true being is not in science and technology, but rests in living with the spirit. And this living with the spirit is the uh, supreme spirit or the universal spirit which manifest or exist in all of individual self. So, the true ideal, true objective of individual life is to realize the, uh, this truth and live in connection with the larger universal spirit and not excessive reliance on science and technology which we very often see in contemporary society. So, for him uh, this uh, role of science and technology is there, but uh, individual must not uh, uh, disconnect or ignore the religious side or the spiritual side of his, uh, his or her existence. So, um, what Arvind, Arvindo believes is that by allowing individual to develop their spirituality, the society will lead to their overall transformation. And then in Arvindo words, a self aware spiritual unity of being and a spiritual conscious community and interchange of nature would be the deep and ample root of understanding. So, the whole understanding between different culture, different society, different community is possible on the basis of this realization. Uh, which transform the individual from a kind of self-seeking, egoistic, atomistic individual to someone who immerse himself or herself in the larger community and realizing the unity, the inevitable connection with the community on the one hand and the larger humanity on the other. So, this uh, will be the true basis of understanding and deep uh, solidarity, deep connection with the 
larger self with the uh, self of the community or the collective self and that is necessary to uh, to uh, to realize the true meaning of self and also to understand the role of individual in the large larger larger society so as we we were discussing for him the individual self is the manifestation so through the individual universal self manifest itself in our physical world so there the connection between individual and the uh, supreme being is also very much very much there so uh, what kind of uh, society is the ideal society it is also a subjectivist society where we have briefly discussed it in our previous lecture that this uh, is a kind of evolutionary understanding of uh, human society which he takes from many western thinkers including kant herder and also karl lemperchen so the contemporary stage of society in which arvindu was living he considered that society as a age of subjectivism this age of subjectivism is growing as we have discussed in previous lecture out of the individualist is and here the man or the individual uh, a spiritual individual not a self seeking self aggrandizing individual of atomistic individualist individualist age this age is characterized by the faith on the idea that only a spiritual inner freedom can establish the ideal human order so that's the connection with uh, self with the larger uh, humanity or the human order as such so that human order uh, in true sense of the term is possible when this age which arvindu thought and envisioned as the age of subjectivism which believes in this spiritual inner freedom so when he was responding to political challenges for india and he was actively involved in political liberation he did believe that uh, political uh, independence or freedom is required but true freedom will uh, be possible when individual realize that the true freedom lies in the inner spiritual uh, life and not just in political and economic life so this is also then recognition of the expression of divine in the individual and in the collectivity will lead to a spiritual evolution which will ultimately unify the humanity that's again the the true unity of humanity is possible when one realizes this expression of divine in the individual self and in the collective self and that realization will gradually lead to a kind of spiritual transformation or evolution and which will then uh, develop a solidarity uh, which is not based on selfish uh, selfish interest or egoistic self so in discussing subjectivism arvindu talked about three spheres the individual the community and the humanity and these three are interconnected we will discuss it through one of his quotation about this interconnection but he see this evolution in this realization at the level of individual and then how it percolates at the level of community and then finally how it transform the humanity as a whole and bring about unity among different groups and communities so these three are autonomous and yet mutually interdependent and that is something which is unique in arvindu's thought and in many other uh, many other thinkers so individual is not defined as a self defining atomistic individual as in liberal uh, bourgeois society and state or also individual is not sacrificed at the altar of collectivity as in many uh, communist or socialist society uh here the autonomy of individual is realized and also uh, the autonomy of other to uh, to uh, community like uh, his or her community immediate community and also the uh, humanity as such so these three are autonomous from each other but yet they are mutually interdependent and each has its specific laws of functioning and what are these specific laws of functioning we will discuss it in a minute for arvindu then community is the intermediate sphere between individual and the humanity it's the sphere which connects which is a kind of spaced in between individual and the humanity so while development in the individual leads to the development in the community 
development in the community results in the development of the community. So, there is a kind of integral continuum between individual, community and humanity as a whole. And these three are somewhat autonomous from each other, yet deeply intertwined or interconnected. Uh, so, uh, development in the individual is based on the eternal truth of self manifestation of the cosmic spirit that we have discussed. So, this, this uh, development in the individual cannot be done in egoism or in isolation, cut off from the larger uh, society, but only when this being or self is in a community. So, the kind of organic understanding of self, where everything is interconnected and interdependent in a way. So, this uh, realization of eternal truth about self manifestation of cosmic truth cannot be done when the self is egoistic self or in isolation, but only when this self is in the community, exist in uh, the community. So, this intermediate sphere helps the individual and the humanity to be complementary. In the same way, individuals too contribute to the development of the community. So, the relationship between individual and community is in that sense very interconnected and one do not lose its identity while connecting or relating with uh, with others. So, um, uh, so, uh, so, Aurobindo in a sense maintain the uniqueness of individual, autonomy of individual, yet regard the individual in connection with the community and the role of individual in creation of that community, especially the spiritual society or community which he is talking about. So, that community can be built when individual which is part of that community realizes the manifestation of this cosmic spirit within his self. So, uh, yet there is a conflict which can be resolved according to Aurobindo by treating others similarly as oneself. So, you treat other the way you treat yourself and then be in helping the needy. This is the way through which one can develop a kind of amicable relationship with the community. So, thus Aurobindo illustrated the holistic relation of the individual, community and humanity, which will lead to the realization of ideal human unity. So, ideal unity is possible when there is a kind of integral or holistic understanding of the place of individual, community and humanity in this continuum and that is the evolutionary kind of understanding. So, uh, more on this understanding of um, individual, community and uh, uh, humanity, we can uh, perhaps understand with this uh, quotation from Arvindu, where he clearly established the interrelations between these three, individual, community and the humanity as such. So, in the first sentence, he talks about the law of individual. Now, the law of individual is to perfect the individuality perfect his or her individuality by free development from within. Now, these two free development and from within is as important, right. So, the law of individual says that everyone should develop himself or herself, his or her individuality perfectly and this should be free from any outside, outside intervention or interference. And again that is not something kind of material or political, but this development of individuality should come from within. So, the free development from within, but, but that is not the end of individual rule, but to respect and to aid and be abided by the same free development in others. So, that is the mutual recognition of similar right to develop himself or herself in others. His law is to harmonize his life with the life of the social aggregate, that is the community and to pour himself out as force for growth and perfection on humanity. So, that is the law one, that is law of individuality. Now, the law of community or nation is equally to perfect its corporate existence, the existence of itself, its identity or its character by a free development from within, aiding and taking full advantage of that of the individual but to respect and to aid and abide by the same free development of other communities and nations. Its law is to harmonize its life with that of the human aggregate and pour itself out as a force for growth and perfection on humanity. 
So, again the law of community when developing its own character taking issues from the character of the individual or transformation of the individual similarly respect the such rights and uh, rights in other uh, communities or nations, but uh, then harmonize itself with such other communities and nations and then uh, think about the larger uh, humanity or perfecting that humanity. Now, then the uh, third is the law of humanity. This law is to pursue its upward evolution towards finding an expression of the divine in the type of mankind, taking all advantage of the free development and gains of all individuals and nations and groupings of men, to work toward the day when mankind may be really and not only ideally one divine family. But even then, when it has succeeded in unifying itself to respect, aid and be aided by the free growth and activity of its individual and constituent aggregates. So, that is the ideal of humanity in Aurobindo Ghosh and these three uh, love are in a continuum and integral to each other's, uh, each other's go, uh, growth. Now, very briefly on his views on religion and nationalism, he resembled nationalism to a religion gifted by God. Uh, God is immort immortal and so is nationalism. So, that is the idea. So, in his thought from a revolutionary uh, nationalist to a spiritual leader, uh, his understanding of nationalism is very different from many, uh, many of his contemporary, where he considered religion, uh, 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 God, uh, religion as a gift of God and so he defines the nationalism and its uh, contribution in the larger human unity. On uh, 19 January 1908, while speaking on Bombay National Union, Arvindo remarked, nationalism is not a mere political program, but is a religion that has come from God. Nationalism is therefore immortal and then the God cannot be killed and cannot be sent to jail. So, his understanding of nationalism is religious, organic understanding of nationalism which he equates with his understanding of religion and God. So, this uh, point we have discussed during the early incarnation, he realized the spiritual as in himself and fo his focus on the um, uh, freedom should be given to individual to grow from within. Uh, he realized uh, himself and then he went to Pondicherry and for 40 years involved himself in the spiritual discipline, spiritual practices, yogic practices and writings and that he spoke through this Uttarpara speech, this realization from within and then pursuit of such uh, urge. Now, that speech for many thinkers was a like Sumit Sarka regarded this speech an indication of an inversion from treating religion as a means to the end of the mass contact and a stimulation of morale to religion as an end in itself. Now, this point of Sumit Sarkar and his critique to Arvindo and his decision, uh, Sugata Bose in response to that is of the view that the uh, Sanatan Dharm that uh, Arvindo was talking about was not narrowly defined as Sarkar and many other scholars used to take. So, what is Sanatan Dharma for Arvindo? For Arvindo, Sanatan Dharma hold a much broader image and it was not a narrow and partisan creed but was as great as life itself. It was for the salvation of humanity. So, for him the understanding of Sanatan Dharma is not particularistic or uh, narrow, but something which is as great, as broad perhaps as life itself and life in, in the sense of evolution towards more and more progressive uh, stages of existence. So, uh, for Arvindo then India should be free not for her own self, but for her role in illuminating the humanity as such or for all. So, it was not to dominate over the weak, but to shed the eternal light over the world. So, he saw the role of India as India freedom is not merely for herself, but for the illumination of the world as such. He further elaborated the concept in many articles, which were published in his journal Karma Yogin where the building of India for the sake of humanity was put as an ideal of the journal. So, many of his activities was towards this kind of a spiritual 
unification or contribution of India in the larger human life. So, in the essay titled The Doctrine of Sacrifice, he stated the necessity to regard the nation as an essential unit, but no more in a common humanity. So, the recognition or acknowledgement of humanity is perhaps as significant as the uh, national uh, independence or national liberation, because um, um, as we have discussed certainly in uh, Tagore, nationalism as an organized um, form of uh, form for the pursuit of selfish interest. Arbindo perhaps also realized be, without the picture of the common humanity, nationalism may, uh, may turn into a kind of national ego, which can convert itself as a collective selfishness at the cost of larger humanity or the unity among the humanity. So, in a sense in Arbindo's thought, this connection of individual with nation or community with the larger humanity is uh, integral or interrelated, where he do not see each uh, as separate or in isolation or in autonomous from the other as many nationalist uh, leaders um, uh, uh, thought about or uh, think about. For him, the Gita did not represent one of the many philosophies of ancient period but a synthesis of many philosophies in unity and in comprehensiveness. In his essays on Gita, Arvindo portrayed the text not to be understood in its metaphysical connotation of the ancient time, but in renewed relevance of the living truths that it contains. So, his interpretation or essay on Gita was more towards future oriented rather than reverting or reviving, uh, reviving the past. So, uh, Gita was viewed not as a means to unraveling the past, but a way forward to the future horizon. So, creation of something new, something that is there in future, something which is more progressive from the present. And he writes, we do not belong to the past dawn, but to the noons of the future. But just as the past synthesis have taken those which preceded them for their starting point, so also must that of the future proceed from what the great bodies of realized spiritual thought and experience have given. So, for him Gita and such text or the understanding of Sanatana Dharma is that starting point to create something in the future which is more broader, much bigger, more progressive than, uh, than in the present. So, his assertion of the future is related to the Hegelian theme of subjective freedom through an ongoing transformation. Here, he employed the qualities of prakritis, which is related to the Indian tripartite understanding of tamas, rajas and sattva and karma, jnana and bhakti yoga to understand this transformation. So, for Aurobindo, tamas represents a state of ignorance, rajas the will of action and sattva is the will to discover the truth of oneself and the, and the world. Combination of rajas and sattva drives man to the path of yoga and in karma yoga, man seeks to arrive at truth through his desireless action. In jnana yoga, he does not only refuse the result of his action, but also disregard himself as the actor. And in bhakti yoga, he has pure devotion to the supreme self regarding it as the self of all other self. So, through this method in Aurobindo, what one find and one can conclude is that realization of true self of the being is possible when enabling or conducive environment for such realization is provided by community and religion. So, this method which he takes from Gita is merely to be a starting point and it should not be narrowly interpreted and defined as it is done by many other uh, many other many other scholars so for him these uh, methods the teachings are the basis or the starting point for creating something which is uh, 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 towards uh, unity among the human of different uh, communities or different uh, uh, nations so uh, uh, by way of that, we come to uh, uh, conclude this uh, lecture on Aurobindo Ghosh, where um, uh, one thing that is very, um, very significant in Aurobindo thought is his holistic vision of human evolution. 
So, he see the human as a progressive evolutionary being from one stage to the next stage and this is considered as a great contribution to political theory. And we are Mehta was greatly influenced by his idea of integral pluralism which we have discussed that different community can achieve its own character and yet realize the unity or truth of sameness or truth as uh, manifestation of one's, uh, one uh, supreme self uh, and that uh, be the basis of uh, human unity is something which uh, is very relevant and alternative to the liberal or the Marxist conception. But there are some confusion, some complexities and mysticism in his thought as well and that becomes the basis for his criticism. One of such criticism is that his ideas remained limited to an esoteric circle partly due to the use of obscure language perhaps as we have discussed his views on Gita, Sanatan Dharma may or may not be uh, as uh, familiar or as accessible to someone coming from other uh, different uh, intellectual or religious uh, social tradition. So, um, uh, because of such use of obscure language and also for the lack of a concrete plan to relate to the human needs of the present. So, what is the immediate need, political, social, economic need? His excessive or obsessive focus with the spiritual, divine or religious aspect of human life or individual life somewhat compromise with the necessity or requirement of the present social, political and economic life. And that makes his thought, thought perhaps uh, significant, yet limited to an esoteric circle which is in pursuit of such religious and spiritual life and must remain uh, somewhat indifferent to some of uh, his great teachings. Uh, moreover, he did not take into consideration the socio-economic and the historical processes of his period, thus maintaining a gulf of theory and action. So, many of his teachings remain in the confine of theory or uh, contemplative uh, in nature, because he kept himself aloof from the political activity as it was unfolding in India. So, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, 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 writes about um, uh, many attempts to invite Aurobindo to respond or participate in the political activities was ineffectual, ineffectual because of his uh, isolation or obsession or uh, involvement in the spiritual work uh, uh, or spiritual discipline and uh, yogic exercises. So, um, so, that was some of the um, uh, some of the criticism and this is also because of the time in which Aurobindo was uh, writing, because of the over dominating nature of the British or foreign rule and also lack of a clear um, possible future horizon uh, of his, uh, his generation and therefore, the uh, uh, recourse to religious tradition, religious vocabulary leads to some kind of uh, confusion, uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, explicit in many of his uh, writings and he remains somewhat obscure uh, also. And yet, Aurobindo's thought is perhaps uh, very significant in terms of uh, thinking about the global order, uh, unity among the, uh, uh, among the different communities or global order, which is possible even without uh, uh, and that uh, global order is a kind of decolonized understanding of self, community and the global order, which remains perhaps his uh, greatest contribution in 20th century, which needs to be further explored and examined. Now, on this lecture, you can look at some of these writings, Foundation of Indian Political Thought and also Peter Hayes uh, situating Sri Aurobindo and from some of his own writings like human cycle, the ideal of human unity, war and self-determination and finally, from Thomas Bentham and Kenneth Deutsch, political thought in modern India, there is a chapter on Aurobindo Ghosh. So, you can refer to these resources for um, understanding uh, Aurobindo Ghosh, his views on self, religion and community. So, thank you.